Hello, welcome to the Copernicus Science Center. We are at UX Poland 2016. I'm here with Kendra Schimmel from uh, Cooper. Uh, Kendra, hello. Hi. It's nice to have you here at UX Poland. We're talking about the responsibility in design this year, and it's our main uh, main subject. Could you please tell me what that means to you? What responsible design means to me? Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Let me think about this for a moment. I think responsible design is thinking about not just the short-term effects of the decisions that you're making, but also sometimes you may solve a really awesome problem, okay? And in solving that awesome problem, you introduce new problems that you may not realize you're introducing. So it's thinking about everything that you're creating and thinking about the longer term implications of that creation, both on the business that you're creating it for, the community that you're creating it, that it may serve, and the, uh, all the constituents that are involved in that product or service. Okay. Uh, could you th uh, tell me about something that was actually well designed and then introduced us to more problems and kind of ended up being big, uh, bad influence on, uh, on the users or on the community around them? Um, I think that uh, the topic of my, my talk, which is mm -hmm. around the on-demand economy, I think a lot of the platforms on the on-demand economy, so companies like Lyft or Washio or Uber, these companies that connect people with a service that they can kind of outsource their laundry or their driving or their whatnot. Um, I think those platforms are designed relatively well. They scale really fast. They are able to um, get the person, the outcome or the result that they want. But I don't know that they're completely responsible um, or at least not responsible yet. And what I mean by that is the longer term implications of these platforms are that they've really introduced a whole new uh, um, way of bringing a, uh, like a job opportunity to a whole new demographic and group of people. Um, and I think it's really important that these services realize that they're essentially, they need to provide HR and all of the enterprise uh, solutions that used to be kind of behind the scenes within these corporations. And we all know how bad enterprise software sucks, right? And these on-demand platforms, they're really kind of bringing the enterprise experience out into the community. And unless they serve those who are providing these services, by helping them run businesses, helping them understand the financial implications of the decisions that they make. Um, they're really kind of only serving one half of the equation, which is the customer. So I don't think they're quite being responsible yet. I think they're catching on though. I think they're learning from their earlier mistakes. We have a lot of controversy recently with uh, those uh, on-demand uh, services uh, that are actually provided by people with the middle middlemen uh, online mm -hmm. like uh, like the uber you mentioned or something like this actually excludes state this uh, this uh, creates a direct uh, connection with very little space for certification for regulation for taxes and uh, in one hand of course it's very appealing and uh, and no one likes paying taxes but uh, somehow we slip away from this uh, safe ground that, uh, that society has created over, over the centuries of development. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you want so, me to speak on that? Uh, I wonder if uh, you th can think of a way to like, avoid it, to, uh, to stay safe and at the same time to be able to provide the services as fast as, uh, as convenient as, uh, yeah, sure. as we get them from uh, Okay, so there's, there's, a couple, there's really three things that I want mm -hmm. to respond. Uh, so, you're, so my understanding of your question is really like um, these companies have created platforms that kind of uh, shortcut the rules and regulations and uh, the, the, your, your perception is the laws and the things that were created by the state. So there's a couple of things going on that I want to talk about. One is these services are 
disrupting industries that in some cases needed disruption um, because uh, the, the standards had fallen or the overall experience, you know, nobody loves to get into a dirty cab, a dirty taxi um, that the person's talking on the phone the whole time and ignoring you. So there's, there's things that had kind of slipped in terms of experience, right? And so somebody came in and provided an alternative. And the first thing to think about is the, the incumbent businesses, the ones that were there first, they are motivated to tell society every horrible story they can, right? They, this is obvious, it's so obvious. Um, so I wanna put that on the table as, I think you have to take all of those stories with a grain of salt and acknowledge that it's in the best interest, interest of the incumbent industries to make Lyft and Uber and all these companies look as evil as they possibly can. Yeah, they are okay. fighting for their ground. Of They're course. fighting for their mm -hmm. ground. So, so I, I always take that into consideration. But with respect to regulations and policy and things like that, I think that um, I think that there is this really interesting dynamic because in one in one case, it's really important that they build relationships early with the cities that they're moving into. And that's not just the communities, you know, they, they do a great job of building uh, the uh, demand within a city so that customers want that and that uh, drivers and other people want to be on the platform. And so that demand um, is a great way of sort of pushing back on regulation, right? Because they can kind of say, well, enough people want it, let's work together and figure this out. But what I think they could do, all these companies can do a better job of is understanding that the relationships that they have with the, with the local governments can actually help them scale more and be a more lasting part of the community. Because those rules and regulations, some of them need to change for sure. And so I think it's healthy that the companies kind of push back on that. But they also evolved to um, put some consistency in place f mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in working together with the local cities and kind of finding a, a new balance mm -hmm. and maybe new regulation, that's where the solution will be found. Okay, so one thing we is uh, that we need to work with our attitude and our understanding of the things, right? Like uh, the way we approach certain areas. But do you think the technological uh, novelties w can help us like uh, measure things better and uh, create more transparent uh, world of information like uh, we are talking a lot about big data we are talking about uh, wearables beacons all those mm -hmm. thinking uh, supposedly thinking items surrounding us and uh, uh, knowing more and more about us like mm -hmm. kind of taking uh, our responsibilities from our hands could you do you think that this could ease up this uh, this tension like uh, another responsibility that we have uh, on our mm -hmm. on our part that to, to come up with a solution uh, can we deposit that on on these new machines i mean yeah if you're capturing data for example about uh the safety of these rides the reality is is that taxis in the past they may have been regulated but you didn't have a picture of the taxi driver you didn't have a way to to communicate or access them, and you didn't understand, um, you know, you didn't rate them, they didn't rate you. And I can tell you, after riding in Lyfts and Ubers, and I, I, I use both companies, and I'm kind of using those, those, that, both companies as an example here. When I ride in a taxi now, I don't feel as safe mm -hmm. because the driver feels anonymous to me. And so in making the case for these newer services, because I'm not saying the taxis should go away. I don't think that. I think all of these companies probably have enough demand that they can all find the new normal and act that way. There's going to always be a place for taxis because the taxis, they know the cities. Like they have way better, they know their stuff better mm -hmm. than the Uber and Lyft drivers do. But in terms of helping to bridge the relationship between these on-demand companies and the cities that they're entering into, they do need to be capturing data that support better case studies around how actually safety may be increasing versus the perception because of these 
one-off bad stories that it's decreasing. Right. And the data, could, the data could demonstrate what's really happening. Okay. What do you think will happen soon as far as trends? What will be the next big thing around us or in our, in our pockets, uh, in our lives? Hmm. Well, uh, the next big trend, well, I think there are three and they're maybe boring. Uh, but the first one is, I'll start with the on-demand economy. For the on-demand economy, I think the next big trend is, is that there's going to be a lot of companies, uh, both software companies and service companies popping up that provide the business and HR infrastructure for these businesses. So you can think about it as the ops uh, mm -hmm. departments for these big corporations. Companies are going to pop up that provide the ops or the... Okay. So H, human resources, for, all the back mm -hmm. office stuff for these big on-demand platforms, right? That's the one thing. The next big trend that I think is going to happen is software technology, big data being used in service of um, uh, sort of optimizing all of the commodities uh, that keep us alive and keep society running. So I'm talking about water and energy. Um, and basically um, tooling all of the big industrial technology so that it becomes smarter and helps us to sort of be more efficient with the way that we run and operate cities and, 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 and big, huge businesses. Um, because over time, um, you know, you can imagine machines that understand, like, they become more self-aware around how the environment around them is shifting and then they can change their behavior in response to that. And I think that that's the, that's, that's the future on a large scale. Mm -hmm. And then in a fun way, like on the tiny scale, um, I feel like we're gonna enter a period of time where we stop seeing so many screens on things because screens are not impressive. Like I was riding in a car and uh, Wyatt, my husband, was talking about how we we're riding in, in this uh, taxi, actually on the way here, a Mercedes, mm -hmm. and the, everything was big buttons. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that interface is beautiful. And I was like, you wanna know why it's so awesome? And we watched, the driver was driving, he didn't take his eyes off the road, he felt the shape exactly. of this button was different than the shape of this button. And that just doesn't happen when you have screens on everything. So the reason that we put screens on everything is because we felt like it I mean, industry did, because it felt like it was perceived as being more valuable. You have refrigerators with big screens on them. You have cars with big screens on them. But the reality is that I think we're going to pull back on that a little bit and start to let the technology be a little quieter and a little less obvious and use the things that physical form materials finish mm -hmm. uh, do better mm -hmm. than screens. Mm -hmm. You know, something has a rubbery corner, you know you can grip it, you can of grab course. it. You don't mm -hmm. get that with screens. Yeah, I, I think with, uh, with the example of cars that you brought, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a safety concern very soon yeah. because uh, we are in love in this, with the screens at the moment. But uh, I already know that uh, all the stuff that I do with buttons in, in my car is, is just so intuitive. I, know, yeah. I, I just know where they are and uh, with the corner of my eye is enough to, to fill out the right one. But... Uh, even if I have a navigation with the touch screens, it already uh, becomes a major, major distraction. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me, uh, so far uh, we are in the third day of, of UX Poland. Yeah. We are past the workshops. Uh, what, uh, what attracted your attention the most? What did you like the best so far? Well, you know, I'm going to say my husband's talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, actually, though, I, I really did. The heart knows. <laughs> Um, I really did uh, love Wyatt's talk because he thinks beyond uh, PowerPoint presentations. He's talking about the, the, the service experience of hospitality and restaurants, and he put on a play. You know, it was a play where you were seeing through these large silver balloons how information moves through restaurants. It's beautiful. It was like so, I was like, well done, well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you for being here. Thank yeah. you for sharing with us. And uh, stay tuned for more UX Poland Talks. Thank you, guys.